If you want to listen to the interview in English, fast forward to 17 minutes 30 seconds into this podcast. Bonjour, My Polyglot Life, c'est un podcast pour les personnes qui veulent écouter un contenu en français avancé et progresser dans la compréhension orale et le vocabulaire, mais aussi réfléchir en français à des sujets de société et des aspects culturels, souvent avec une vision féministe, décoloniale et soucieuse de l'environnement et de justice sociale. Je suis Cathy Introligator, mais je me présente comme Cathy Intro pour faire plus simple. En tant que coach neurolinguage, je partage des conseils sur l'apprentissage efficace et personnalisé des langues. J'offre aussi des séances particulières de coaching, des groupes de conversation et de la formation pour les éducateurs qui voudraient se former à la méthode Neurolanguage Coaching et obtenir la certification. Tu peux trouver des informations et me contacter sur mon site internet mypolyglotlife.com Si tu veux soutenir le podcast et accéder aux bonus, tu peux t'abonner à l'espace Patreon sur patreon.com slash cathy.intro Ce podcast est principalement enregistré à Montréal. Donc, en introduction, je tiens à souligner que les terres sur lesquelles je vis et travaille, appelées Tiochake ou Montréal, font partie du territoire traditionnel non cédé des Kanyankeaka ou Mohawk qui a longtemps servi de lieu de rassemblement et d'échange entre les nations de la région. Je rends hommage aux savoirs ancestraux qui sont pour moi une source d'inspiration constante. Si tu veux améliorer ton français dans un esprit respectueux des cultures, de chaque individu et de la nature, tu es au bon endroit. Bonne écoute Bonjour et voilà, c'est le dernier balado de l'année 2022. Ce dernier épisode est bilingue. L'introduction est en français et je t'y présente les grandes lignes de l'interview qui va suivre en anglais avec Elphine Waters, la créatrice de All About Italian. J'ai aussi ajouté quelques réflexions personnelles dans l'introduction. Si tu veux entendre Elphine parler en français, je t'invite à écouter ou à réécouter notre précédente interview du 9 décembre 2021, il y a un an donc. Si tu veux écouter seulement l'interview en anglais, avance jusqu'à 17 minutes 30 secondes dans cet épisode. Les questions étaient différentes, donc même si la philosophie de l'apprentissage d'Elphine et la mienne n'ont pas changé, par rapport à la première interview, nous avons abordé d'autres sujets et d'autres angles. Donc c'est quand même intéressant d'écouter les deux interviews et de voir aussi comment des idées similaires peuvent s'exprimer en anglais et en français. En effet, parfois, on pense qu'on n'est pas aussi fluide dans une langue que dans une autre, en particulier quand on a un niveau avancé ou très avancé. Mais parfois, c'est juste le chemin de pensée qui est différent et aussi les contraintes de la langue. Mais aussi, je dois dire que plus on maîtrise une langue, surtout notre langue maternelle, plus on veut ajouter des informations, des détails, des fioritures. Ça, ce sont des choses qu'on ajoute pour faire joli mais qui ne sont pas forcément essentielles. C'est pour ça qu'on a l'impression d'être moins efficace quand on communique dans notre langue seconde. C'est la difficulté et la beauté de parler plusieurs langues. Dans une langue étrangère, on ne met pas tous ces artifices qui nous donnent plus d'éloquence. Parfois, on a les capacités pour le faire, mais on n'ose pas. Il y a peut-être une sorte de syndrome de l'imposteur un sentiment d'être illégitime dans cette langue qu'on dit étrangère. Mais on peut aussi voir les choses d'une autre façon. La langue étrangère nous incite à aller à l'essentiel, à être synthétique et à exprimer le cœur de nos idées. Le reste, finalement, n'est peut-être pas si important que ça pour notre auditoire, les personnes qui nous écoutent. Les fioritures, l'éloquence, le raffinement de la langue, ça va venir après beaucoup de pratiques et quand tu ressens le besoin d'aller chercher ces mots de vocabulaire plus précis, plus harmonieux, plus imagés. Je t'invite à construire des bases solides pour ta fluidité, pour ta capacité à exprimer des idées et à continuer coûte que coûte, c'est-à-dire malgré les difficultés. Sur ces fondations, 
tu pourras progressivement ajouter des choses de plus en plus complexes. Alors, sois patient ou patiente, ne perds pas ton énergie à regretter que les progrès ne soient pas plus rapides et utilise plutôt cette énergie à mettre en place une routine du français qui se traduit en progrès régulier. Si tu ne sais pas comment faire ça, mon programme Feuille de route te permettra de créer ton plan d'apprentissage personnalisé. C'est un coaching de deux semaines de format hybride, c'est-à-dire qu'il y a des modules de formation en ligne et des activités de journaling, mais aussi deux séances de coaching avec moi et du feedback personnalisé. Les informations sont dans les liens sous l'épisode. Si tu ne te sens pas à l'aise d'exprimer tes opinions en français, j'espère que cette interview te donnera la motivation pour continuer sur ton chemin. Parce que honnêtement, le secret est là, dans une intention de s'améliorer, dans une pratique régulière et dans le fait de prendre du plaisir dans ce processus d'apprentissage avec ses hauts et ses bas. N'aie pas peur de rêver en grand. Par exemple, comprendre les films en français, écouter des podcasts, lire de la littérature, vivre en français et mets en place ce qu'il faut pour atteindre tes rêves. Mais revenons à mon interview avec Elphine. Comme l'interview est en anglais, je voulais quand même proposer un résumé en français pour te permettre de continuer à pratiquer ta compréhension avec moi. D'ailleurs, si tu cherches un exercice à faire en lien avec mon podcast, peut-être pourrais-tu faire ton propre résumé en français de cette interview pour mettre en avant les points les plus significatifs pour toi. Je tiens aussi à faire ce résumé parce que le premier point que nous avons abordé me tient particulièrement à cœur et je pense que c'est important de le répéter. Nous avons commencé l'interview en rappelant qu'on peut se donner la permission de ne pas importer la philosophie de la culture de la productivité dans l'apprentissage des langues. J'avoue que je participe aussi à ce mouvement de culture de la productivité, par exemple en publiant des podcasts qui s'intitulent « Apprendre avec la méthode agile ». Passer de 0 à B2 en un an, c'est possible. Qui semble entretenir cette obsession de chiffrer, de mesurer notre apprentissage. Mais que veux-tu J'ai aussi besoin d'attirer de nouveaux et nouvelles auditeuristes et suivre certaines tendances marketing me permet de me faire connaître sur Internet et d'attirer ton attention. Dans le même temps, si tu me suis régulièrement, tu sais que j'ai une conception des objectifs et du processus d'apprentissage qui est centrée sur le plaisir avant tout et sur la flexibilité et l'adaptation à tout type de profil. J'essaye de proposer des visions différentes sur l'apprentissage et sur comment mesurer nos progrès. J'ai beaucoup aimé cette métaphore d'Elphine au sujet de l'apprentissage des langues, qu'elle compare à une relation amoureuse. Dans cette relation, on apprend à se connaître soi-même autant que l'autre, et les bons moments, comme les moments où on traverse des difficultés, des épreuves, font partie de l'aventure. Là où Elphine et mes autres invités qui avaient cette vision plus entrepreneuriale de l'apprentissage des langues se rejoignent, c'est sur la dimension sociale du langage. Je vais y revenir, mais je voudrais aussi préciser que les mots « vision entrepreneuriale » sont souvent connotés avec une conception capitaliste ou néolibérale de l'entrepreneuriat, mais il existe aussi une multitude de visions entrepreneuriales. Bien sûr, chaque entrepreneur souhaite que son entreprise se développe et continue d'exister. Mais chaque modèle est différent. Tout le monde ne désire pas une croissance sans fin. On peut avoir une mission sociale, on peut vouloir assurer sa subsistance et celle de sa famille, avoir comme principe directeur l'amélioration de nos conditions de vie, de l'environnement, etc. Donc, de la même façon, tu peux choisir quelle orientation tu veux donner à ton apprentissage. Au fait, si tu es prof ou que tu aimerais donner des cours de français langue étrangère et aider tes apprenants ou apprenantes à trouver le chemin qui leur convient le mieux, les aider à prendre confiance pour s'exprimer, je t'annonce qu'en 2023, j'organise des sessions de formation en français à l'approche Neurolanguage Coaching pour te permettre de devenir coach de langue certifié. Il y a un lien avec les infos dans la description de l'épisode. 
Et là où Elphine et mes autres invités et moi-même nous rejoignons aussi, en plus de la dimension sociale du langage, c'est sur ce constat qu'on apprend la langue en la vivant au maximum. Apprendre une langue, c'est une opportunité de découvrir une culture et les personnes qui incarnent cette culture et toutes ses variations. Communiquer dans une langue étrangère nous ouvre des fenêtres sur les autres comme aucun autre outil. Et c'est un complément essentiel à d'autres manières de communiquer comme les pratiques créatives, les arts, la musique, la danse, la peinture, le dessin, la broderie, etc. et nos habitudes culturelles. Le langage est ce qui permet de donner encore plus de sens aux pratiques créatives et même à la vie quotidienne, comme l'art de cuire les pâtes, ou de faire et de déguster un espresso à l'italienne. C'est grâce à cette immersion de plus en plus profonde dans la culture de la langue cible qu'on va pouvoir lutter contre les stéréotypes. On peut faire des généralisations des pratiques d'une population, je veux dire, le cliché des Français et Françaises avec leur baguette sous le bras trouve quand même son origine dans la réalité et les habitudes de consommation de beaucoup de Français et Françaises. Mais quand on a une meilleure connaissance de la diversité des locuteuristes d'une langue, on ne les enferme pas dans des stéréotypes. Ce type de connaissance peut aussi aider à identifier ce qui peut être un comportement discriminatoire ou raciste envers une personne qui a immigré dans le pays. Parfois, des apprenants et apprenantes peuvent penser que le problème vient de leur niveau en français, alors qu'en fait, il s'agit peut-être de préjugés, plus ou moins conscients, ou d'autres mécanismes discriminatoires dont ils et elles sont victimes. Mais je m'égare et revenons au résumé de l'interview. Dans l'interview, Elphine nous parle des retraites linguistiques qu'elle organise dans la petite ville de sa famille, sur la côte entre Rome et Naples. Pour se perfectionner dans un art ou dans une langue, il faut beaucoup d'heures de pratique active. On apprend en faisant, même si c'est inconfortable et qu'on fait des erreurs. Dans notre conversation, Elphine souligne que s'éloigner des grands centres urbains peut être une bonne idée pour augmenter les occasions de pratiquer. En effet, dans les petites villes et les villages, les personnes qui parlent anglais ne sont peut-être pas aussi nombreuses que dans les grandes villes, et donc on est forcé d'utiliser la langue cible pour communiquer. On découvre aussi un autre rythme de vie. L'Italie rurale, comme la France rurale ou des petites et moyennes villes, a un rythme moins effréné, moins rapide que les capitales où les serveurs, serveuses, vendeurs, vendeuses n'ont pas le temps ni l'envie de faire la conversation avec les clients et clientes. Prendre des pauses, être plus conscient ou consciente du moment présent et prendre le temps de s'imprégner de l'ambiance locale au lieu de cocher les cases d'une liste de choses à faire nous procure souvent une expérience plus relaxante. On ne revient pas de nos vacances plus fatiguées que lorsqu'on est parti. Bien sûr, ça demande un peu de self-control. Pardon pour l'anglicisme, euh, peut-être que je devrais dire de, de contrôle de soi. Ça demande du contrôle de soi. Mais en France, on utilise majoritairement le mot self-control. Et donc ça demande ce contrôle et de se préparer à répondre aux questions de nos proches qui se demandent pourquoi on n'a pas visité ceci ou cela alors qu'on était si proche. Comme je l'ai mentionné au début, on peut se donner la permission de ne pas suivre la tendance du « toujours plus » la recherche de la photo Instagram parfaite. Quand on prend le temps d'aller à la rencontre des gens, et encore plus si on essaye de communiquer dans leur langue, on vit une expérience vraiment plus personnelle et qui nous touche profondément. On offre aussi à ces personnes à qui nous avons parlé une expérience de voyage, même s'ils sont chez eux. On apporte l'exotisme, entre guillemets, dans leur vie quotidienne, et c'est tout aussi important pour rapprocher les cultures. C'est d'ailleurs un point que nous avons abordé dans l'interview. Que faire pour immerger notre cerveau dans la langue et la culture si on ne peut pas faire un voyage linguistique Tout le monde n'a pas la possibilité de le faire et comme on l'a vu ces trois dernières années, nous pouvons être limités dans nos mouvements en raison de circonstances exceptionnelles du jour au lendemain. Et ces conseils s'appliquent aussi si tu vis dans une région francophone mais que tu travailles en anglais et que ton groupe d'amis est international aussi. Dans ce cas, 
l'idée est d'amener l'immersion chez toi. Je sais que c'est difficile de se mettre à étudier après une journée de travail stressante, ou quand tes enfants sont autour de toi et te demandent de l'attention ou te distraient. Mais si la langue fait partie du temps que tu prends pour toi, si c'est connecté à quelque chose que tu aimes et qui est agréable, tu as le droit, et même le devoir, de prendre du temps pour toi. Ce temps pour nous-mêmes est essentiel pour notre bien-être mental. Alors pourquoi pas intégrer la langue dans cette bulle de plaisir Et commencer par 5 minutes, puis progressivement augmenter la durée. Mais on n'est pas obligé de faire une heure par jour. Pour revenir à la métaphore amoureuse, l'important est d'entretenir cette relation. D'abord avec nous-mêmes, puis avec la langue. Faire partie d'un groupe ou d'une communauté d'apprenants et apprenantes, même un groupe de deux, donne aussi une vie et une réalité à cette langue. On peut apprendre à reconnaître et accepter notre singularité, que chacun apprend et communique d'une façon unique. On peut se soutenir et utiliser la compassion collective du groupe pour avancer ensemble. Et si ça t'intéresse, n'hésite pas à postuler pour rejoindre l'un des groupes de conversation de My Polyglot Life. Il y a plusieurs groupes et plusieurs niveaux. Donc postule et les prochains groupes vont commencer en janvier 2023. En conclusion, je voudrais souligner cette phrase d'Elphine. Quand tu commences à apprendre une langue, tu ne sais pas où ça va t'emmener. Quelle porte ça va ouvrir Quelles opportunités vont apparaître C'est une chose qu'on entend fréquemment chez les personnes qui parlent plusieurs langues. Ce qui a commencé comme un hasard, un accident, un sujet scolaire, un passe-temps, les a amenés à vivre des expériences ou des opportunités professionnelles qu'ils et elles n'auraient jamais imaginées. Sur ce, je te souhaite une très belle fin d'année. Je te rappelle que tu peux t'abonner à ma newsletter pour recevoir toutes les infos et être informé de la reprise du podcast. Je vais faire une petite pause pour écrire les prochains épisodes et la prochaine publication après cette interview sera au mois de février. Alors joyeux Noël si tu le célèbres ou si tu célèbres autre chose et tous mes voeux pour la nouvelle année de notre calendrier. Et maintenant, je t'invite à écouter l'interview d'Elphine en anglais. Hello, we are here with Elphine Waters today to talk about sustainable language learning, meaning it's efficient and good for your mental health. You learn in a way that is easy for your brain and pleasant. And one of the components of this way of learning is immersing yourself in your target language. Live and breathe your language. And as much as possible, live and breathe your target language. And Elfin teaches Italian, I teach French, and we both share a Dolce Vita approach to learning. And if you speak French, check out the interview we did a few months ago on my podcast, and the link is below the video. So. The interview was in French today where you're speaking in English so we you can practice both languages and today we'll talk about immersive methods language retreats and myth about language and life one myth has to do with the, the stereotypes of life in France and Italy mostly Italy uh, because Elfin lives in Italy and the languages and the, um, the second is, second myth is about learning fast and easily So, c'est parti. Hello, Elphine. Thank you for being here today on this channel and accepting my invitation to chat. Cathy, hi. Thanks for having me. It's great being here. I was just listening to you and um, have a wonderful... It's true that France and Italy have a lot in common when it comes to going beyond the myth and the stereotypes. And I know for myself, when I'm immersing, when I'm learning a language, I often start with TV shows, pop culture, because you learn a lot from that. And then I move on to literature. And, mm -hmm. and I hope all of that helps break that postcard image, that those stereotypes that you have when you start studying the language. But when you start looking at uh, TV shows and how they live in day-to-day -day life and the the sociology of the characters in the shows, like the, the rich ones, the lower class people, and the dynamics between everyone in the society and where they hang out, how they speak. That's uh, so fascinating. And, um, and we need to take that into account when we learn a language. If you learn like the postcard French or postcard Italian, and then you go there to the country and 
I think the Japanese have a syndrome, like Paris syndrome, because they, if they haven't checked anything about France before, they arrive in Paris and they're shocked by it's dirty, the, the servers are not nice and, and everything, and they just collapse and, and cry all day. Um, yes, I totally what, understand that. How is it with Italian in Italy? I think it's more or less the same thing, especially if you go to Venice, where, you know, Venice, it's, it's insane. Well, it used to be insane. Before the pandemic, it was insane. Or, or Rome or Florence, where... Well, it's not even a sustainable form of tourism, but let's not get let's not go there. The postcard image, the postcard image, the whole myths, the stereotypes, they're offensive towards the country that you're trying to approach. They're they're um, offensive to you as a learner. I mean, you have to grow out of them. You know, it's not France, for example, is not only the guy with the baguette. Uh, under his arm and, and so on, you know, all the, the incredible stereotypes. I, the, the stereotypes are good. I mean, good in the sense that we have to, we, we have labels. We tend, as human beings, we tend to create labels and, and they sort of help us sort out, put order in our, in our messy lives. But obviously you have to look for the messiness as well. And the messiness is good. The messiness means that you're getting towards the true country. You will see, I mean, it's like a person. When you fall in love with a person, you have to see the good and the bad. Otherwise, what's the point? You're not truly in love with that person. You're, you're having a crush and crushes are good. Crushes are wonderful. But, but maybe if you want something more, the relationship to last through time. I'm sorry, I'm sticking to this image. <laughs> if you want like a that, long-term yeah. relationship. <laughs> Take the good and the bad. <laughs> you have to also see that person when they wake up in the morning. Sorry, just stop me. <laughs> no, that's great. I love the image. See how Italy and friends wake up in the morning. and then... Exactly. The, the like, message for example, southern Italy, Naples, Naples is heartbreakingly beautiful, but it's really, some, some areas are really dirty. Life is definitely messy. It's less of a picture perfect uh, situation, but there you see true people, authentic people that will connect to you emotionally, that will consider you a friend. And so let's put it this way. If you go beyond the postcard, you, it can be a bit intimidating at first because I understand we all want things to be perfect, but then you find things that truly matter. Otherwise, you'll just stay blocked behind on the surface of things and you will feel like you're in this tourist bubble and you'll feel like you're seeing things from the outside. But if you want to see the heart of things, the motor of things, the things that truly drive the country you love, then accept the, the messiness, the rudeness, the occasional rudeness. Uh, yes. Mm. And I think that if, if we're going to stay in that tourist bubble, we might as well stay at home and put on the, the virtual device mm -hmm. so that we can see in 3D the beautiful wonders of the world. But maybe let's not waste a, a plane ticket to just go there and tick off things from our bucket list without going further, without trying to connect with the people. And, and language is a great tool to connect with, with the people from those countries. And connect with ourselves. And the tourist bubble is... Mm, tourist bubble can be a bit sexy. I mean, we all say, oh, I don't want the tourist bubble. But, you know, it's... I've, Anybody who's listening at home, it's okay to be a bit stuck there because we tend to resist change. We tend to go with things that are easier for us. But push it a little bit more. Burst that bubble a bit and you won't be disappointed. Step by step, little by little. And, and actually, you, you organize retreats in Italy. So you take uh, people who've been learning Italian for a while and they want to get a taste of uh, what it is to be in Italy, to speak Italian with Italians in the language and really take everything in, make the experience more than just about language, but more about language, life, and living the life associated with the language Italian. So can you tell us more about the retreat, the, the goal, and how it works? It's funny because before you mentioned the word, you used the word sustainable. And I think that my language retreats are sustainable in that I'm also encouraging sustainable tourism, you know, encouraging people to move off the tourist trail and 
travel in small town Italy, where the pace of life is again sustainable the pace of life is slower but also life is more authentic and it's just easier to get in touch with connect truly to the with the community which is really hard to do in more tourist traps like rome florence venice beautiful places wonderful but if you get stuck there you end up having this long to-do list of places you have to visit and you get really tired you don't you don't come out of it enriched you come almost blinded in beauty overwhelm because you've seen so many beautiful things but you haven't had time to let them sink in so that is one aspect as well but the idea came to me from from my students All of my ideas come from them. I would just hear them have little tiny breakdowns when they would be in Italy. (laughs) They would be, you know, rushing from one destination to another and would be disappointed because they didn't feel they were communicating and they didn't feel like they were actually living in Italy. They just felt like they were tourists and they would blame themselves and, and you know, sometimes it has nothing to do with you as a student, as a learner, but it has to do with where you go. If you are in Rome, the waiter doesn't have time to allow you to pra- time to practice your, your language. They're in a hurry. They want to get their job done. It has nothing to do with you. But, you know, we, we, don't, we don't realize that when we're in it. Mm-hmm. But then the other seed was planted when I noticed that some of my students, when they came to Italy to visit... They were fascinated by the small things. They wanted to come and do the shopping with me. They wanted to, I don't know, pick the right, pick the things at the shops with me, the ingredients, or help me boil the water, slice the onions, uh, have a coffee in the piazza, you know, do the tiny little things that I took for granted but are part of my day-to-day routine. Nothing extravagant, nothing, but it was, you know, the small things and that, that gave the feeling that, they were living and breathing and being a part of Italy. And then the last piece that just definitely gave me the complete idea, it was just like little tiny pieces of the puzzle. Then when I was visiting my mom, she was really sick. I would spend a lot of time in my hometown. That is, you know, this really small place between Rome and Naples, a bit out of the way, Easy to reach, but you have to know it's there. It's incredibly beautiful, but that's not why the place became so popular in my Instagram. It's the town is Gaeta. Uh, it was incredibly popular. It's incredibly popular because they, they, people are fascinated by the tiny images of, I don't know, images like seeing men, the fishermen knitting, preparing their nets in the morning, preparing new nets or bringing in the fish after a long day or the fishmonger yelling, ah, oh, fresh fish here or people selling fruit at the corner or little old ladies knitting outside of their house or the old men playing cards in the sun. These little moments, these tiny moments, stills of daily life I would show everything, the sea, the beauty, but also, you know, the the people, and they are part of the beauty of Italy, small town Italy. Italy is not only the scenery, but the people, the, 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 and through them, we, we truly, through us, you truly connect. And it's the life, the pace of life in my hometown is really slow. <laughs> Even too slow. Don't you be <laughs> But it gives you the time to think and I appreciate so much now that I live in the north I appreciate that piece of life really a lot I need it as well it gives you time to connect to feel what your priorities in life are because that's the trouble with the hustle and the bustle is that it can be exciting but it makes you forget Mm. what really matters to you you get caught up in this wheel in this whirlwind whirlwind of to do th- to do lists you know whirlwind of, whirlwind of things you want to do which is great to do things but sometimes you really have to take time to be and appreciate the here and now and my hometown Gaeta, the south slow living is a reality there and that's that's where everything came together to me in my mind and I started inviting people over 
So you're to inviting job. people to your, your little corner of Italy, that's right. Yes. People are curious. Oh, you're learning Italian and they'll start speaking to you, you know, in small towns. You, you can chat so easily. <laughs> you can start conversations that started even too easily. And it's a really heartwarming experience for me to share something that I love and has so much meaning to me. And our passions always show and reflect in what yes. we do. Yeah, that's something that's often hard to do in very touristy areas or busy areas. You're, you're not confident in your language and then you want to start speaking, but the people don't have time and then they switch to English because it's faster or they want to help you. But and if you don't have that confidence to stick to the target language and continue speaking in Italian or French, then those touristic places, they don't help you and you end up being more frustrated about how useless you are in that language and all. But if you go out of the beaten track to smaller communities, then you really reconnect with that motivation of why am I learning the language? Why am I doing so much effort? Because I want to communicate with those people and that's the only only thing that we have to communicate is me learning that language. So it's... Um, It's, it's great to take that time and having someone to, to go with you helps explain. Because when you go in a supermarket in a foreign country, you don't know what to pick and is it all, what do I yes. use that for? Yes, 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 absolutely. Even reading a menu can be a challenge, you know, just understanding and why is this dish important? Why should I eat it? Does it have a story behind it? You know, there's so many conversations to be had when you're in a big place. That is not possible. Just there's also the thing about overwhelm, you know, you, you're getting too many inputs at the same time. That's why even in my retreats, I schedule breaks because people need time to take everything in and to just and they also have to give themselves some um, some peace some uh, take in the, the life as well and the pace of life is slow in some parts of Italy and is authentic mm -hmm. and um, yes this this and what would you say are the the biggest impacts on the language of doing a retreat what's Are your, do your skills improve or what's happening after that retreat? Everything improves. It's also your relationship to with language that is really important. We don't talk about it enough, but how what our relationship is with the language we're learning is something that we have to reconsider from time to time, reassess. You become more confident. I mean, the, the idea of going to a small town is that you can actually make connections. I mean, two of the people who already joined my retreat decided to come a second time and they just felt like they had were picking up from where they left off. They felt connected to the community to that point. That is something you don't get a lot. When you go on a holiday, uh, you don't get that feeling. You get that you're going there and then you're leaving and the, the sort of the experience is isolated. Instead, when you feel that you have sort of planted the seeds for connection to the with the community, it changes how you feel about yourself and the language. You, of course, your, your language skills improve drastically because you're bombarded all <laughs> throughout the day <laughs> the, yeah. <laughs> but yeah in a, in a beautiful way but mm. you but you're also learning the language of the culture because you get to a point where you um you know the language so now what you are fluent what are you going to do with that you want to do more and you don't really know where to go because you're you're curious about the culture the life what what is going on in the language that i love so much in that country how do i understand do i have the tools to truly understand that culture what most people do is they read blogs on what they try to decode what that culture is people that come to the retreat start by speaking and interacting with natives of all from all walks of life they get the tools to start seeing the culture from the inside they ha actually have conversations about lifestyle it's an exchange because then at the end of the day you in the retreat you understand that what you're doing learning a language is not only impacting you and by only impacting you 
but you're also impacting the people that come to meet you, the people in the language you're learning, the community of the language you're learning. It's an exchange. And that is beautiful if you think about it, because it adds so much more meaning to what we do. And when people in the community appreciate that you are learning a language to connect with them, you realize that you are contributing as well to the conversation between countries. And I think that at a time like this, we were talking about this earlier, true conversations without intermediaries, without translations are, are vital. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. So, so yes, you improve your listening yeah. skills, you improve yeah. your speaking skills, you become more confident. In the retreat, I, I, I focus on finding what works for you during the retreat, not only through the exposure, no? improving also your relationship with the language and also learning to see all the opportunities you meet because sometimes we, are, we have all these opportunities around us, language learning opportunities, but we don't know how to pick them. First of all, because the establishment, the industry doesn't always acknowledge that learning happens in so many different ways. There's a sort of yeah institutional idea of what language learning is. And so many people, many learners are not aware that some things are language learning if you, you know, you, you are aware of it and you apply it with some constants. And it's really important to uh, also appreciate your differences because in the retreat you meet other learners. And that is beautiful because you're connecting. The value increases, you know, you go to the retreat, but then after you have that community of people with whom you've lived those incredible days and shared meaningful moments, but you also learn to see the differences between you and other learners. You swap, you swap notes, you exchange tips, and you also understand how you're different and that's okay. That's what, mm -hmm. I mean, we're all unique in our language learning journey. That's wonderful. We have to learn to embrace it more so that our language learning can be journey can be even more effective because when it's, you know, even more tailored and it starts from us, it doesn't start from our teacher, coach, whatever. Mm -hmm, and we absolutely. have to get to that stage in which we appreciate what we have to contribute, what our strengths are and learn to capitalize on them. Yeah. Exactly, it's uh, the group is nourishing. It's, it's so yes. much a richer experience, uh, but we have to each find our own place in that group and uh, and create that uh, collective intelligence, collective yes. compassion, and, and everything. Um, oh, I uh, love that collective compassion. Yes, yes, yes. yes we should do more <laughs> <of it. laughs> And uh, so going on a retreat is great. And of course, if we can, it's a great experience. But for people who cannot or who haven't been on a retreat yet, what can we do at home to get started on that immersive experience to connect with that culture and, and practice our language? You Well, the connection with the country starts long before you've set your foot outside the door. And, and I say it starts right from the beginning. You don't have to wait till I'm intermediate, wait till I'm fluent. No, no, it starts from immediately. And it, and it, it, can, and it can take place in so many different ways. There, it, it really depends on who you are and where you are in your language journey and how you feel about it. If you're more shy, if you're more introverted, if you're more of an extroverted. There are some people that are able to find language exchanges and make them work for them. I personally have never been able to have never had the patience to do it and then from the language exchanges build relationships that sustain themselves and take them into incredible directions um, but it can also be through I don't know tv shows uh, mm, through music through I don't know if you find what it is that resonates with you what really you, you maybe it can be books I have one student who's just riding her way through to fluency, through C2, entirely through books, talking about books, authors that she likes, writing about them, just breathing it and just trying to decode the country through the books. She started a long time ago. It's been a lot of effort. But if it's something that really means, has a meaning for you, you just keep on going at it. But it can also be other things. For example, I'm into mindfulness and self-improvement, and I find ways to blend that with, uh, with language learning. It can be through TV shows, just saying, okay. It also comes with setting an intention. 
Because if we, before whatever it is we do, we can cook our way to fluency, we can eat our way to fluency, which is a wonderful way to go. But it all starts with an intention. When you decide that that is going to have meaning, it's going to be that moment, that's 15 minutes in which you're connecting to Italy, to France, to wherever it is that you're learning, that, that, that adds meaning. You can journal about the, the dish you ate. You can journal about the cooking you did, the recipe, what went well, what didn't go well. Did you put some music on, some Italian music while you were cooking? Or did you listen to the recipe through audio? Were there some words you didn't know? Did you, when you taste the dish, that I'm going, still going with the food metaphor, you could, what, what, tastes did you feel what can you how can you say that in italian for example with italian that's so important because talking about food is a skill in itself we do that so much in the retreat uh my my students just witness how we sit and discuss meals plan meals and it's such a big part of our social life and I think uh, French and Italian spend as much time talking about food than eating Exactly. And so, and so you can, those are things that food is just the easiest way to go, both mm-hmm. with French and Italian. It's just that the, it's insane not to do it, but it can also be other things. Again, I work a lot on TV shows in a TV show, in an Italian TV show, in a French TV show, you will see the geography. Let me just double check. Where was that place? Where was that scene shot? Or what is it that they're eating? What is that book the guy has on the shelf? What is the song they're playing there? Just double check. Check the names of the actors. Research them on Instagram. Make it intentional and allow mm. yourself understand that that too is language learning. Change the settings of your phone. Put some of the apps that you have, put them in Italian if there is the option. Some of them do have Italian. The world is, is, is the sky is the limit. It really is. And it's, don't let that, just pick one area that you know resonates with you. You know, identify those things that you love doing. Maybe it's exercise. I exercise three, four times a week. You can do that. Find some tutorials on YouTube. I have a student who <laughs> during the pandemic started exercising with YouTube and he found a YouTube ch- uh, channel of fitness. And then after when it was safe to travel again, he contacted the, the girl that offered courses, in-person courses in Italy, and they connected there. I mean, it's, it's fun. It's wonderful. It, it helps you not, it helps you get out of that tourist bubble. Mm-hmm. But it's relevant to you. It keeps you motivated. And when things are relevant to you, you do them better. You're more inspired. You don't rely on motivation. Motivation ends. This You have only so much motivation left. But it's also more respectful to who you are. And it taps into your strengths and yeah. allows you. And then when you're speaking about your passions, you're a whole nother person. It so, can't stop you. You have the eyes light up and, and you're exactly. unstoppable. Mm-mm-mm. One of my students, he came to the retreat twice. He's passionate about photography. And now in May, he's going to Tuscany and will be hosting his own photography course in Tuscany. And I'm like, you know, you never know. You're starting a language Sometimes you even start by accident. You never know where that language will take you. And it's amazing. So it means he's to that point where he can, he feels confident showing people around in Italy because he feels good there and he feels like he's uh, comfortable in his area, I guess. Yes. And it's amazing. He's uh, putting together the two things he cares about most, Italy mm-hmm. Photography. He loves sharing things about photography. It's not work know. for him. He's just having a nice time with people. <laughs> well, he's also going to get paid, which isn't bad. But I think it's just, it sends such a powerful message to us, you know, that sometimes we think, oh, it's only language learning. Oh, it's a hobby. But once we keep moving, we are setting in motion things. Mm-hmm. We are making, bringing about change in the world. We are getting closer to our dreams and who knows what will happen. Yeah. And yeah. Who knows what will happen when it's part of our life, anything can happen. Exactly. 
Finally, about learning language fast and easily or wanting to learn fast, but also having a life, a full-time job, kids, or who knows what, we all have a lot of things going on. And for you, I think it's very important that we, you said you care about mindfulness and, and balancing mental health, physical health. How do we balance language learning efficiently and mental physical health? I think it connects before with allowing, understanding that language learning can happen in so many ways. And so just giving yourself permission to not be, not bring productivity culture to your language learning. I'll keep it as short as possible. But the I minute that. you understand that productivity culture mm -hmm. is out to deprive us of our life and of our happiness, big man, big business wants us to be involved, enveloped in productivity culture. Once you understand that that is something you, you have to resist a bit. You have to, for yourself, for your family, for your loved ones, you have to get out of productivity culture and prioritize finding some time for yourself. Language learning is this powerful tool to find things about yourself that you want to stop and do. So I always suggest starting with five minutes because five minutes is never five minutes. You find out that you have, we are not aware of how much time we have. We think we don't have time. And I know because I fall into this trap all the time, you know, we're just not prioritizing well or we're setting too many things to do and they give us the feeling of uh, the overwhelm. And, but if we sort of say, look, I love learning this language. This is important to me. Tell your family for five minutes, I'm closing this door. Don't call me unless the house is on fire. You will have resistance within yourself. You, your family will be a bit confused for five minutes. They'll get used to it. They'll recover. And you will be happy with those five minutes. You will feel, wow, I had five minutes entirely for myself, entirely for my thoughts, entirely for my language learning. Let's see if I can do 10. And you will also feel better around your family, your, your loved ones, your partner. You will, because you're engaging in things that you love, you will be feel more rewarded. And, and this connects to fast learning because fast learning, mm, in the sense that fast learning puts a lot of focus on the results instead of putting focus on the journey. And when we focus on the result and not on the journey, we all lose. First of all, the, re the result will take time and you're not enjoying the journey. And that's a pity, what's the point, you know? But, and when you, if you start to take five, 10 minutes to enjoy the journey, instead of obsessing with how many words do I know? How fluent am I? What is my level? When you're focusing on the journey, you don't care how many words you have. You don't care about the tenses. You don't care you, you're so happy to be doing something you enjoy that who cares? Yeah, who cares and that the result will come because you're consistent and you're constantly doing it. So the result yeah, will come. Yeah, the result happens. You're connecting, you're happy, you're a happier person. You will show up for yourself, show up for the language you're learning, show up for your loved ones as well. You're happier, you feel, wow. I spent 10 minutes on myself, <laughs> which I know. You it's know, a luxury. Ten, yes, 10 years ago, it would have seemed absurd that I'd be trying to explain to people how to find 10 minutes in their day. But the thing is, Kathy, if you cannot find 10 minutes for your language learning in a day, you don't need to be learning another language. You need to be having a long conversation with yourself and say, hey, something needs <laughs> to be fixed here because my life, I deserve more in life. <laughs> Yeah, and that's the trick, I feel, because teachers, and, and I'm one of them, I always give you tips to be more efficient. And and it's not about being more productive per se, but as you said, it's being more efficient so that you can have more time for yourself, more time for your uh, hobbies and other things in life that you like. And that how can you make things pleasant? So that it doesn't feel like a chore. It doesn't feel like you have to do this, but you, it's just part of your life and it integrates naturally into your life. And it's not about being the best or being productive. It's just about managing the time and your emotions so that you have the best possible day ever, every day. Exactly, Kathy. I, I, I don't know if it's okay. I want to share, if anything, you cut it ahead, out or what. I want to share um, all this I didn't just wasn't born with these ideas in my head. <laughs> but uh, four years ago, yes, my mom, five years ago, my mom got really sick and I was her caregiver, basically. 
And I, 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 she had a heart condition. I knew she was going to be sick and it was going to get worse. I knew it was going to get really bad at some point. And, and somehow I, I decided my, my days were going mostly focusing around her. And I decided because I knew things would get worse, I decided I needed the tools. I didn't have the emotional equipment to deal with all of that. So I would just wake up half an hour earlier. And I just told my family this. I told everybody and half an hour in that half an hour, I will meditate and do some Spanish. And then my day officially begins. And you will not believe it, but it just helped me get through all that half an hour that then ended up stretching out a tiny bit. Helped me have the strength throughout the day for whatever happened throughout the day with all the things that came after. It gave me the tools because I'd sort of regenerated, rejuvenated through those activities. And so it ended up, I was more present for my mother that way because I took that half an hour, you know, to just be with myself. And so I, and that just opened my eyes because you just realize how impacting, taking care of yourself, how you impact others as well. Yeah. And I, that's also something I experienced myself is when you feel you have to do too much things and it's just crazy that you need to do more to do, sorry, you need to do less. Yes. That's when you need to make more time for yourself and then things will work out because you'll have a fresher mind and you'll be able yes. to organize your time in a different way. But if you just stay stuck in a constant wheel, turning, 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 you don't have the mental space to get organized and to be more calm and serene about what's going on. So if you feel overwhelmed, just stop. Breathe, do nothing, Breathe. and do then nothing. get back to figuring out your life. Yes, absolutely. No, no, it's good for us, for our health, for not only our mental health, also our physical health, because our body mm -hmm. needs us to be a bit more at peace. Yeah, and languages provide a great opportunity for a break. As you said, you, you did that with Spanish journaling in the language or just having a good time not thinking about anything but that foreign culture that's it's a true break you're not going on vacation but you're taking a break outside from your life while you're engaging with that other language and culture so that's uh, it's very refreshing language learning is the vacation in a way because you're mm -hmm. doing it with your mind you know i'm going to go there some at some point you know and so it's um your daily little vacation Yes. <laughs> Let's all plan daily little vacations of languages. Love that. Remind us where people can find you. There's a link below. But um... yes, they can find me at All About Italian. I have a blog and then they can find me over at uh, I also host support podcast with my fellow three, two fellow teachers, Comparole Nostre. And you can also find me at Instagram, All About Italian. So thank you, Elfin, for this uh, very thank stimulating you, Elfine, for talk. Thank you for having me. Thank you. you voilà, si vous aimez ce podcast, n'oubliez pas de vous abonner et d'en parler autour de vous. Et je vous dis à très bientôt sur My Polyglot Life en français.